So in some sense, if I decided, okay, I don't think I want to cover those questions again, then I think you have enough help here. But I think because of the mechanical nature of analyzing heat engine cycle processes, there's some value in you seeing me just to go through that again. So I, I think I'll do that now, um, knowing that it's a duplicative of these content and it'll be duplicative on purpose, as in, I know I'm <laughs> duplicating something that I've done, but you know, let's do it. It's uh, um, for those of you who might want to see additional examples, it's good to have additional examples. And if uh, you've had enough examples, then you don't have to watch this. So uh, uh, one thing I'll make sure, because I've done this once, the cycle with the adiabatic expansion, let me do the cycle with the isothermal expansion. I think, uh, um, so the last time, the reason I chose this was uh, within the lecture videos, I do have an example with isothermal expansion. But um, hey, I'm already duplicating context, so might as well duplicate something different. So, so uh, uh, let me do it this way. I'm going to pick out. Um, so the next uh, four questions should be um, should be the heat engine cycle process, and I'm going to pick out the four different ones. Uh, ones involving isochoric, and then I'll look for isobaric, isothermal, adiabatic. I should have them at some point. So I'm just going to copy this over. And by the way, these are all randomized. There's a question pool of eight questions of those system picks. Uh, no, sorry. There's a question pool of four questions. The question picks eight of them to give them to you. So uh, these are duplicated. Uh, the, um, it, the numbers are randomized enough that I thought it would be OK to have it set up that way. Um, so, um, so, 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 you know, your question one might not be isochoric process. It might be something different. Uh, but uh, let me just go through here, picking out. Okay, I have isochoric. I have isothermal. And um, and depending on how lucky I got, I might have to. Or beyond the next question. So let me just keep going. Question three, okay, it's isochoric again. <laughs> let me skip that and get to isobaric. That's what I want. And I think I'm looking for adiabatic. Uh, isothermal, I already have that. Uh, adiabatic. And I forget if they were all expansions or if they were randomized between expansion and compression. Um, let me check. I think are they all expansion? Yeah, I guess yeah, they are all expansion except for isochoric. So I think the idea is that they all go from um, uh, go from kind of lower left side of the PV diagram to right top side of the PV diagram, or I guess, no. So right top, if that the bias is first to go to the right expansion, <laughs> and somehow if the process precludes that, then it goes up like a heating. Um, so in for all of these cases, the heat transfer is either zero or positive. I think that's how it was constructed. And you know, if it's either cooling or contraction, then you reverse this. So. I, I think that's why I didn't really randomize that. So I have those four processes picked out. And again, knowing that I've covered those exact four processes before, let me do them again as an, another example. They have different numbers. And in this case, I'll also plug in numbers after working out the, the, working out the algebraic expression. And I think partly because this is really a mechanical process we are going through mechanically working through these um, uh, this, these steps uh, that's quite similar to um, in spirit to Newton's law problem solving steps. I think there's a value in repetition. This is um, 
so you know when you are learning something new, there's a, the idea of drilling it. Uh, drill and the kind of things that benefit from drilling practices are things that are mechanical, things that should come automatically after you've are practicing enough. It's a, in other sense, it's a, uh, things that might be considered boring. It doesn't take a lot of creative energy. It doesn't take a lot of um, clever ideas. It's again mechanical. It's a, uh, but it's a, a necessary part of the fundamental skill set that will help you do the creative tasks, uh, questions that are uh, more involved than what you see here. So uh, let me just uh, go through here. Um, so th this is the preamble for each of these questions. Idealized hidden just like can be built from these named processes. Uh, calculate the, so this is all the same things that it, the questions will be asking. Calculate the internal energy change, delta E, net heat transfer, Q, and network dog. And oh yeah, calculate this. And um, I hope when you see these uh, three quantities mentioned that that reminds you of the first law of thermodynamics, because that's really what we'll be using first uh, law. The, which relates these three quantities together, the net um, in, or internal energy change, net change over a cycle, is given by net heat transfer. Here, the sign convention is that positive means heat is flowing into the system, minus work done by the system. By the way, I have had uh, people who are confused by this symbol and our sign convention. I think chemistry uses the opposite convention. In chemistry, when they talk about work, they are talking about work being done on the system. And with their sign convention, this has to be positive and this should be work being done on the system. So uh, just be aware that different disciplines have different sign conventions and you just have to be familiar with them and you have to use the correct one, which is the physics one. <laughs> so uh, with that, um, so I think I'm about ready to start and I'll just say all these pieces at the beginning and I won't, I'll just move this um, and I will, will try not to say this every single time for the remaining three. Um, as you're looking at this expression and trying to do the calculation of these quantities, very often you will be able to directly calculate a net change in the internal energy or work being done. And the tools you use for directly calculating them, well, for work being done, there's the definition of work. It's a pressure times a change of volume. And depending on the situation, you might have to take into account some um, uh, change of pressure while volume is changing. So, but with that reminder, that is the basic relationship we can use to figure out the work done directly often and change of internal energy you have the equipartition theorem internal energy can be directly related to the temperature more precisely for our context change in internal energy is proportional to the change in temperature and it's proportional in this exact way degree of freedom divided by two and kb times delta t and this degree of freedom I highlight this while noting the type of gas. And this is one of the few things that you might just have to have memorized that if it's a monatomic gas, then degree of freedom is three for three spatial dimensions. If you have a diatomic gas, the convention we usually use is degree of freedom is five. Um, it's the picture is more complicated than just five, you know, depends on the temperature at really low temperatures, the rotational degrees of freedom are frozen out <laughs> at really high temperatures. You have unfrozen uh, vibrational degrees of freedom. The most conditions we are dealing with about room temperature, the, you have the three spatial degrees of freedom plus the two additional degrees of freedom that comes from different ways things can rotate. I think I lectured on this, but 
remind it. So, um, so with the internal energy, you have this degree of freedom over two times nKBT. That's your equipotential. Uh, equipotential. <laughs> that's your equipartition theorem. Now, I can do a bit of a simplification here using the ideal gas law. Ideal gas law says that pressure times volume is um, number of gas molecules times Boltzmann constant times temperature. And here's the useful similarity between this and this. So really when you have, uh, so, you know, change of NKBT, which, you know, here the only quantity that really ever changes is the temperature. So when you have a quantity like this, you can calculate that from change of pressure times volume. So very often for these calculations, we'll have a degree of freedom over two times change of pressure and volume or pressure times volume. Uh, this is more useful because you, you see the numbers that are being specified here. Often they're not giving us the number of gas molecules or temperature sometimes, but they are giving us enough information to calculate the other things. So, and, and, the, and there might be other contexts where we use uh, ideal gas law as well, maybe to uh, fill in some gaps, missing information on some of the um, thermodynamic quantities. So, so these are some of the expressions we have in mind to try to solve for internal energy and work it on directly. And, um, and I haven't given you any equation or formulas for solving for Q. And that's because there really isn't one. There isn't one that can be applied all the time. And I know this is a different approach from what you might have seen in chemistry, because um, and different approach from what we used in chapter one, um, in context where you could talk about heat capacity, specific heat capacity of things, and the heat energy cycle processes where you have ideal gas. That's the type of situation where it's not really appropriate to try to associate a specific capacity to the gas because um, how much heat is transferred it really depends on a number of other things was the volume changing was the pressure constant and all that stuff and you might then you know memorize the specific capacity for constant volume and constant pressure and the thing is that doesn't cover everything you have isothermal processes you have adiabatic processes so really the better approach is to simply admit that we don't have a formula for q in fact um but rather what we could treat as formula for q is this the first law because in the first law once you have the change in internal energy and you have the work being done by the gas then you have a way to calculate your uh, net heat transfer which is equal to change in internal energy plus the work done by gas so so first law is your formula for um, heat, heat transfer once you have the work done and in change of internal energy so with that, let me just uh, go through the calculations. And all these named processes are named because they have uh, uh, the names give you quite a bit of information. So when you see that something is isochoric, that immediately tells you the change in volume is zero, which directly tells you that work being done is zero because work being done is pressure times change in volume. So no work done. Zero. Okay. Um, oh, so that tells you also immediately that whatever you calculate for change in internal energy is going to be your amount of heat transfer. So whatever you calculate here will be the same. So good. I have one number left to go. I need a change of internal energy. So there I'm going to be using this. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. So I have the volume. That's a, the constant volume. And I have the pressure change from this pressure to this higher pressure. So I can just uh, do the calculation. Let me do that. Um, yeah, yeah. And let me take a little bit of care in how I do that. Um, I'm going to do, um, for all these four calculations, let me be careful to do this calculation here. Given this, 
I'm going to write a P final, V final, minus P initial, V initial. Now, uh, you know, in our case, you know, the velocity, the losses, the volumes are the same. So I could factor it up, but let me just not do that uh, in the, in favor of giving you the set of steps that will never cause you to make a mistake. So, so with that, uh, let me just plug in the numbers. I need um, product of P final and V final. So 830 kilopascal times 0 0.01 cubic meter minus P initial, V initial, 150 kilopascal times same volume, 0 0.01. So that's my change in uh, pressure times the volume. And at this point, my numbers are in the unit of kilojoule because I plugged in the unit for kilopascal. So uh, let me multiply that with my degree of freedom, which should be five because diatomic, divide by two. And again, that answer is in kilojoules. I want my answer in joules, so multiply that with a thousand. That should be my answer there. So 17,000 joules. And that's it. Um, <laughs> um, so, so with these questions, uh, probably the hardest step is um, as you look at the name of the name, the process, figuring out um, which quantities held constant or what information that name immediately gives you. Once you have that done, the rest are, uh, it, the, the math is easy. Math, there's nothing really hard about math here. So, okay, the next question. Uh, okay. okay, so the next question, this one is about isothermal expansion. So that tells me something right away. Uh, it tells me that change in temperature is zero. And from the expression I wrote above of regarding internal energy, it immediately tells me the change in internal energy is zero. Because if temperature didn't change, then, then, um, then no change in internal energy. That's the equipartition theorem. Now, I appeal to first law of thermodynamics again, which says that change in internal energy is equal to net heat transfer minus work being done by the system. So, ah, I have, um, so this is going to add up to zero. So, right, zero here. <laughs> and, um, and, Again, you can treat the first law as something that gives you the amount of a heat transfer, given other information about change of internal energy and the work being done. So my heat transfer in this case will be simply be the work being done by the gas. So in this question, I really have to calculate only one quantity. And once you have that, you can plug it in for both heat transfer and work done by the system. So, okay, now I need to work, uh, calculate the work being done by the system, and that's the part where I don't really have a shortcut. Now, there is a formula in the textbook that you could look up and use, and you're, it's fine for you to use it, but let me just, sh uh, the derivation isn't actually all that hard, so let me just show you the derivation from scratch. You have, you start from this uh, expression, which is that uh, infinitesimal amount of work done is given by pressure times infinitesimal change of uh, volume. And the reason you have to specify it this way is because in this case, my pressure is a function of volume. So as your volume changes, your pressure changes. And so you have to imagine breaking up the entire interval into tiny little pieces and then uh, treating for each of the tiny pieces. Pressure has been constant. Calculate the area under, under that and then add it all up. And if this sounds like a description of going to integral from Riemann sum, I think that's covered in calculus one then that's because it, that's what it is. I, I like to give this a description of the Riemann sum because oftentimes the students have this um, very abstract approach to integrals that I think is not really helpful in when you're trying to um, set up your integral for a physics question. 
Um, what I found useful when I was a student is to imagine setting up the Riemann sum first. Imagine setting up the idea of, okay, um, I know for very uh, small amount of volume change, if I have pressure times that volume change, I know the small amount of work being done. And for the, oops, and for the total work done, um, I, all I have to do is sum this up. And um, that helped me visualize and come up with the expression for the total work done. And really the step that you need to hear is, okay, turn this uh, finite volume change into infinitesimal change. And that's the step that gets you into integral from some initial volume to a final volume. So integral between that initial state um, to some final state you reach, um, and the, that gives you the work done. So that's the total. So um, in working this out, we have a couple, well, we have one other expression that we rely on, which is because, um, you know, I have this acknowledgement that my pressure is going to be a function of volume. We need to, um, we need to figure out, um, oh, how is the function expressed? And here the, um, the useful, useful relationship is the ideal guess law. Pressure times volume is equal to N K B T. So I can express this pressure as a function of volume. And KBT divided by volume. Now, looking at this, you might um, look at the question again and wonder that um, I have expressions that I'm not given here. Uh, how, what do I do? And this is where it's useful to recognize that when you have an expression that is generally true, like this ideal guess law, it's also true for very specific uh, positions, specific states, specific circumstances. For example, we have this uh, relationship that pressure times volume is NKVT. And here, you know, my, my temperature is constant. So all these things on the right hand side, they are constant. They're not going to change through this isothermal process. So once we have this general relationship, we can also say, Initial pressure times, uh, yeah, times initial volume is also equal to NKBT. So once you realize that, you can actually take this expression that you don't know and change it with something that you do know, initial pressure times volume. So initial pressure times initial volume is over V. This V is a variable, and that's going to be equal to pressure as a function of V. And the, these are all now given quantities that we can work on. So, so let me just quickly do that. Uh, so I have, um, let me just substitute this in there. So it's going to be integral from V initial to V final, uh, PI times VI over V, uh, DV. And let me just do this quick integral, um, factor out the things that are constant. I have an, uh, antiderivative of one over v. Hopefully you remember from your calculus that that's a natural log of v. So I have antiderivative natural log of v evaluated from v equals v i to v final. And in the lecture I did this uh, whole um, logarithm algebra. And when you finish that logarithm algebra, what you end up with is um, natural log of v final over v initial. So you have a nice ratio here that gives you a unitless number. You can plug that into natural log to get a unitless quantity. That's going to give you pressure times volume. Or uh, that combined with the initial pressure times initial volume will give you the work done, which is the number that you need here. So let me plug the numbers in. Uh, I have my initial volume of um, 0 0.06 cubic meter. So, uh, so, okay, let me do it this way. I need the final volume, 0 0.26, divide by initial volume, 0 0.06. Okay, that's the ratio. Let me put it through the natural log times, okay, now I can do the pressure times volume. 
initial pressure is 290 kilopascal times initial volume is 0 0.06 cubic meter. Now, because I put in kilopascal, the sensor here is in kilojoules. So in joules, it's 25.5 hundred or 25,000 and 500 joules. So that's ought to be my answer here. 25,500 joules. So yeah, that's it. Um, again, not that hard. <laughs> the, the, the part where you have to be careful is going from the given information to figuring out, or given information in terms of the name of the process to uh, connecting it to the mathematical information that it implies. And note how for this particular question, I didn't have to use whether it's a monatomic, whether it's a diatomic, because um, really the work being done, it doesn't depend on that degree of freedom stuff. So uh, sometimes you use this information, sometimes not. Okay, let me keep going. Now I have uh, this up. Now I have uh, this process um, of um, isobaric expansion, and that tells you something right away. <laughs> well, one of the things it tells you is that pressure is going to be constant. So, okay, so no, no integral on this one. So I guess what this tells you is that it tells you that you can calculate work done directly as a pressure, the constant pressure, times the change of volume. And I think that's all that tells you. Um, in some sense, isobaric expansion is the most uh, complicated one because um, going back to our first law, which tells you that change of internal energy is Q minus the work being done by the system. So it also tells you how to calculate the heat transfer, which is the change of internal energy plus the work done by the system. Now in this expression, um, basically nothing is given to you from start. You, your internal energy will change. There will be work being done. <laughs> and once you figure out these two non-zero numbers, then you will know what the heat uh, transfer is. So the isobaric processes take the most amount of work in the, in the non-mechanical sense to figure out everything. So, but let me go through that. Uh, let me stop complaining and just do it. Um, so since the work being done by the system, it's the easiest thing to calculate. Let me do that. I have the pressure. I have the change in volume. I can just do the calculation. So my pressure is two, 290 kilopascal times the difference in volume. 0 0.38 cubic meter minus 0 0.01 cubic meter, okay, uh, equal to, so that's 107.3 kilojoules, uh, because I put in kilopascals, so let me put in um, 107,300, 107,300 joules. That's my work done. Um, and that's where my <laughs> easy stuff ends. Um, for the change of internal energy, which should be the next thing I tackle, um, so I'm gonna have to use a little bit of ideal gas law because when I have the expression for change in internal energy from my equipartition theorem, that's my degree of freedom. Diatomic tells me my degree of freedom is five. Degree of freedom divided by two, and kb times the delta t. This portion here, we use our ideal gas law, pv is equal to and kbt, or if we're talking about differences, difference in pressure times volume gives you the difference of this quantity. So since we are not given any of the temperatures or number of gas particles, what we really should do is rewrite this expression in terms of um, in terms of this change in pressure and volume, so five half times 
change in pressure and volume that will give me the change of internal energy. So, um, oh, and I can do a bit of a simplification, which is that there's a change of pressure and times volume. What it really is, is it's a, uh, um, because pressure is constant, I can factor it out. It's pressure times change in volume. And once I have that, oh, I've done that already. That's my work done. So really all I need to do is take my work done, multiply it by five halves, and that's my change of internal energy. So, uh, so let me calculate that. Um, oh, I have that already times five halves, uh, 268,000 and 2,500. No. Well, let me just write it out. <laughs> it's a lot easier to write it out than then say. Okay, that many joules of um, change of internal energy. And once you have that, then the heat transfer is given by the sum of these two numbers. So let me just do that on screen here. It's 375,550 joules. So, so with the isobaric expansion, it's uh, the way I like to think about it is um, so the amount of the work that the expansion is doing it tends to lower the um, lower the internal energy if there was nothing else happening. But when you look at the isobaric um, isobaric expansion, it does also go from place where it would have lower temperature to higher temperature. So the way I like to think about it is there's a, just a, so much heat transfer that the energy being transferred in heat, it's enough to do the work and raise the, in, um, raise the temperature, raise the internal energy. And again, isobaric process is the one that takes the most to work in some sense but maybe a little bit easier than isothermal. You don't have to integrate anything. Pressure is nice and constant. <laughs> um, okay, so this is the, our fourth and the last process. Uh, it gives us the adiabatic expansion. And as before, the name of the named processes tells you some information right away. Here it's telling me that heat transfer is zero. Oh, so I guess this is the one rare one where I don't have to use the first law to figure out what the amount of heat transfer is. Question tells me heat transfer is zero. <laughs> We're done. Good. <laughs> now, um, here it's actually still useful to use the first law because um, it turns out instead of giving us what the, uh, instead of serving as a formula for heat, it actually gives us a shortcut for something that could have taken a longer route. So first law says, um, again, change of internal energy is net heat transfer minus work being done by the system. And so here, the work being done by the system is something that potentially takes uh, quite a bit of work because uh, with the adiabatic processes of uh, adiabatic expansion, what you have basically is uh, something that takes um, curvy process like this, but this is not uh, something that goes uh, like one over X. Um, this uh, curve, uh, it's an adiabatic curve. It, uh, the relationship that this curve obeys is that really pressure times volume raised to a factor gamma that uh, this gamma is described in the textbook. See textbook. Um, is constant. That's really the condition that this curve enforces and, um, and, and calculating this area under the curve you can do it, but there's a shortcut. And the shortcut is, once you know that heat transfer is zero, then you have this uh, relationship right away. Change in internal energy is equal to work being done by the system. And this is a much easier thing to calculate because changing the internal energy, as I keep saying, or um, so, so well, let me just go through the proper steps. The change itself is equal to a ch um, 
change is always equal to NKB times the change in temperature. But through the ideal gas law, you can express this as change in uh, pressure times volume, okay, which is a final pressure, final volume minus initial pressure, initial volume. And these are what we call state variables. They only depend on the end point. We don't really care what kind of path this thing took from here to here. And, um, and this is a much easier thing to calculate than the integral. And after we've calculated that much easier thing, we can, uh, we can say that that's equal to the work being done by the system. So, so we'll do that. Oh, uh, I, we are going to calculate the, um, change in the internal energy using this expression and then say that that is also the work being done by the system. Now I'm looking at here. So I'm being given my initial volume, my final volume. Uh, and I have the initial pressure of the gas, but no final pressure. And that's because with this constraint, they don't have to give it. Uh, uh, we, it's something we ought to be able to calculate. And in fact, let me do that. So from this expression, what I can say is my, uh, my initial pressure times initial volume raised to vector gamma is it going to be equal to my final pressure times my final volume raised to factor gamma. I need the final pressure. Let me solve for that. Final pressure is equal to initial pressure times the ratio volumes for initial over V final, um, the ratio raised to factor gamma. Uh, let me do this numerically uh, first so that as I do that other calculation, I don't have this gunking of my thing. And um, and this is where, um, so you do have to know the numerical value of the factor gamma. Um, I think it's defined as a CP over CV. However you remember is fine. Um, I do have it memorized that for diatomic ideal gas, gamma is uh, seven over five. If you have it memorized, like me, great. <laughs> if you don't, <laughs> look it up in the textbook. <laughs> uh, important thing is that you don't know, you do know what number it is. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, let me do the calculation for that final pressure. So, I have my initial pressure of 320 kilopascal times, let me do the ratio of the volumes, my initial volume of 0 0.04 divided by my final volume of 0 0.23, raise that to the power of 7 fifths. That's equal to, okay, so 27.6 uh, kilopascal. So my P final is going to be 27.6 kilopascal for later when I might need this number as I do the calculation. Okay, so let me do the calculation. So uh, this time I do ha just have to do this calculation in full without, I can't factor out anything. So I'll just uh, do that. Um, so, okay, my final pressure, 27.6 um, times my final volume, uh, 0 0.23 um, cubic meter, minus my, uh, and my calculator does the order of operation automatically, so I can do this. My initial pressure, 320 kilopascal, times my initial volume, 0 0.04 um, cubic meter, is equal to, um, yeah, I did something wrong. What did I do wrong? I'm getting, um, oh, oh, I know what I did wrong. So I got confused by negative answer and that negative answer is fine. What I, <laughs> I made a sign error here. So I have a minus sign here. So I need a minus sign here. So my change in internal energy isn't exactly equal to work done. There's a reverse of reversal of sign. So it makes perfect sense. My internal energy 
goes down. This is uh, connected to what you've seen in lecture, that with the adiabatic expansion, that there's a change of internal energy, there's a change of temperature, there's a kind of cooling that happens, temperature goes down. So it makes a sense, my internal energy goes down. So this is minus 6.452 kilojoule. So it's uh, uh, minus 6.452. Minus 6,452 joule. That's the change in internal energy. And in terms of work done, because it's expansion, it should be doing positive work. And with this minus sign, all of those things match up. So there's a positive 6,452 joule of work being done. So let me plug in numbers for this just to make sure that I got it correctly. I mean, I think I did, but let's just be sure. Minus six four five two zero and six four five two. Yeah. Okay. What? Oh. <laughs> the mistake I made was in this step, sorry. Uh, this is a mistake I used to make when I was teaching this class for the first time. I don't know how I reverted to doing this. Uh, assuming this is one, it's not one. There's a factor here. This factor here ought to be uh, degree of freedom divided by two. And I think I covered it way back up there. So, um, so all, to all these things that I calculated, there should be times a uh, degree of freedom over two. So, or in this case, because it's diatomic, the degree of freedom is five. So there should be, um, there should be five over two. So let me just tack, uh, multiply uh, five over two. And so, um, 16,100 joule, that's what it should be. Okay, and I think a rounding thing is fine. The, that would have been, if there was an issue, it would have been fixed a long time ago. So, all right. By the way, the system knows to ignore these extra pluses and commas and all that stuff. All right, um, all good. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, so, so yeah, <laughs> it, it's a lesson on um, both showing your work because when you uh, are in habit of showing your work or you know keeping track of your work, then you can track back and figure out what you might have uh, mistakenly forgotten, and you can fix them much more easily than if you are if you don't have that. That's one, <laughs> and two, the, just the value of um, uh, practice because uh, like I. I've done this many, many times, but even, and uh, in fact, at the very beginning of this session, I've said, you know, I, it's not like I've forgotten that, but um, it's the kind of things that we do forget from time to time. Um, people make mistakes and um, the um, way you avoid making mistakes is you uh, go thoroughly. Uh, I'm, I'm not, um, while I wouldn't recommend developing OCD because OCD is a disorder. It's not a healthy thing, but um, sometimes checking things like a person with OCD can be a valuable thing, especially in a multi-step problem solving things where a single mistake can lead to a um, uh, single mistake out of many multiple steps is uh, something that uh, leads to an incorrect answer. 